please join me in giving a warm conference welcome to Bill Rausch. Bill? Hi, everyone. You can hear me? Excellent. I am honored and I'm happy to be here with all of you today talking about my favorite theater in America, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. And yeah, and the way that the stories that we tell on our stages in Ashland are so important to me as an artist and also as an Oregonian. But first I'm gonna back up and start with my own journey into what has become my career-long commitment to telling stories that reflect our communities. It began in earnest in 1986 when I became the founding artistic director of Cornerstone Theater Company. My college friends and I had heard a really upsetting statistic. 98% of the American people didn't go to professional theater on anything approaching a regular basis. Uh, and in fact, a professor of ours told us in class that theater was a dead art form. We loved the theater, we wanted to prove our professor wrong, and the easiest way it seemed to us was to find out why people didn't feel that theater was an important part of their lives, was to get to know them. And what's a better way of getting to know people than doing a show with them? So the 11 of us who were founding members of Cornerstone bought a big blue van and we hit the road. We moved into tiny rural towns, usually populations between 200 and 2,000 that had no active tradition of live theater. We spent five years living anywhere from two to four months at a time in communities across the United States, from Virginia to North Dakota to Maine to Florida to Texas and lots of places in between, mounting plays with first-time actors of all ages for an audience that included their families and their neighbors. We turned a welding shop, a city hall basement, an abandoned high school gymnasium, and a cattle auction barn into theaters where we would perform. We also lived in unusual places because we raised the cash costs of our projects ourselves, only asking the community to provide performance space and housing and what we would call otherwise unoccupied facilities. <laughs> in practice, that meant that we lived everywhere uh, from some smelly trailers in the leaf of a highway clover to an abandoned fast food restaurant to that vacant high school where we would cook in the home ec room, shower in the locker rooms, and roller skate through the hallways uh, in the wee hours of the morning, which was really good for exercising high school demons for all of us. <laughs> After five years of work with rural communities, we eventually chose to settle down in Los Angeles because of the remarkable diversity of communities. In LA, it really is like you're in driving distance of the whole world. And what started as just a two-year urban residency became a home. Cornerstone Theater is now in its 25th year of working with both urban and rural communities, continuing to thrive under new leadership ever since I moved to the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Over the years, the way that we did our work at Cornerstone changed and grew, and I want to share with you some of the things that we learned. We learned that what we did always succeeded, even amidst occasional spectacular failure. People were always willing to come together across huge divisions to create art. African Americans and European Americans who had been locked in a two decade long economic boycott in a Mississippi town. Fundamentalist Christians and atheists debating the true nature of morality in a timber town here in the Pacific Northwest that I'm going to talk about a little bit more later. Uh, neighbors in a South Los Angeles neighborhood who feared crossing a block to be in a show because of rival gang activity. Surprisingly courageous individuals again and again crossing lines to make something beautiful. We learned that everyone has a story to tell and that everyone has something to bring to the table. We did an adaptation of Moliere's Tartuffe in a Great Plains farming town of 250 people right at the heart of the late 80s family farm crisis. So as we worked alongside farmers to adapt the play to their realities, Moliere's play about religious hypocrisy 
became a story of the disintegration of the family farm. Our desire to be relevant with an expose of televangelism quickly faded into irrelevance. As professional artists, we learned that we had to pose some of the questions, but we did not hold all or even many of the answers. But I'm going to back up again and tell you how we came to do what we considered complete blasphemy at the time, which was to adapt classic plays. In our very first season, we were in the Badlands ghost town of Marmoth, population roughly 190, uh, living in an abandoned railway bunkhouse and producing Hamlet in the oldest vaudeville theater in the state of North Dakota. Early in rehearsal, community cast members were struggling with Shakespeare's language. And interestingly, it wasn't the these and the thous or the iambic pentameter, but it was the nouns and the verbs and the adjectives that had either changed their meaning or ceased to be part of a vocabulary altogether. Uh, I would point out when they told me how frustrated they were, the helpful footnotes in their script, but the community actors pointed out that the audience wouldn't have those footnotes. I assured them that we could add clever props to make certain meanings clear. They were completely unimpressed. <laughs> Finally, they challenged me. If you people want to make a piece of theater that is immediate and important for our, the people of this community, why don't you just change some of the words? We were flabbergasted. <laughs> you simply don't rewrite Shakespeare. But here were our community collaborators challenging us to more fully, fully live up to our mission. And before we knew it, we sat down to adapt Hamlet. A week, yes, a week later, we had a reading with our cast of our wonderful new version. The next morning, a cast member who was a local rancher knocked on our bunkhouse door. He had to quit the show, he said, because he was a Sunday school teacher and he simply couldn't be in a play with such language. We had first thought that he meant some of the colorful swear words that we had added that sounded to us very Shakespearean. But in fact, he was also referring to Shakespeare's own potential blasphemy. When Hamlet called, oh God, God, was he praying or was he blaspheming? And until we could answer that question, the rancher wasn't going to be in our play, and many others were likely to follow suit. An emergency meeting of the Town Historical Society was called. <laughs> we 20 something sat around the cafe with a group of elderly ranchers and their wives and went through every potentially problematic reference in the text. We used blue post its for our swear words and yellow post its for Shakespeare's. <laughs> After a few moments, we sat back and just listened as the community had a debate with itself. The men admitted to using some of this language, but not in front of the women. The women admitted to using some of this language, but not in front of the men. <laughs> what was the true purpose of art, anyway, to show life in a sanitized form or as it truly is? Then they began to point out how phrases like, there's never a villain dwelling in all Denmark, but he's a downright prick, was, not to put too fine a point on it, smart-alecky college humor. If we wanted to truly reflect the community, we'd use a phrase like horse's rear end. <laughs> and thus, a cornerstone style adaptation of a classic text was born. Needless to say, it was much richer, much more reflective of the community's vernacular and realities, and that rancher Sunday school teacher stayed in the cast and performed brilliantly. At the final dress rehearsal, he was sitting next to me watching the big confrontation between Hamlet and his mother uh, which is laced with this extraordinarily uh, spiritual imagery. And uh, the rancher said to me, this play is about important things, isn't it? I'm really glad we're doing it. It, it, it reminds me of, the, there was a post-show review that we overheard in the lobby that made us so happy. Uh, this rancher in a big cowboy hat said, yep, a guy should see it twice. <laughs> which we thought was the highest praise ever. Certainly in North Dakota, but everywhere we went, we learned about perseverance, about eating lunch with the tribal elders on a Paiute Native American reservation in Nevada for 30 days in a row until a tribal elder finally agrees to be in your adaptation of the Greek tragic trilogy, the Oresteia. We learned to bartend so that the bartender and his wife in a small town could play Horatio and Gertrude in that Wild West version of Hamlet. We learned to follow the community's lead in times of crisis, too, 
11-year-old Tiffany Dozier was killed by gang gunfire in front of our performance site after a dance just a few weeks before our opening night. We wondered if it was responsible to have another nighttime event at the very same facility so soon after this tragic murder. The cast, which included friends and relatives of Tiffany, told us that we had it completely wrong, that the play had to go on because of Tiffany's death. We learned again and again to move out of our comfort zone. We learned to expand our source texts outside the Western canon, to do passages of plays in Spanish, Mandarin, Korean, Tagalog, and American Sign Language, to create access through language. We learned to find the courage to talk to the person in the room with whom you are certain you have the least in common and who makes you the most afraid. For me, it was usually guys with gun racks in the back of their pickups some of whom went on to become my friends and my colleagues. We learned to assume that everything is possible. In Mississippi, we cast as Romeo a high school senior, Idret Brinston, who had failed the state literacy test twice. Soon after mastering his leading role, he passed the state test with flying colors, and he graduated from high school. In an L.A. neighborhood, we undertook a three-play cycle. In the first play, we cast a young woman named Stephanie Escobar, in the second production, Stephanie's mom joined as an assistant stage manager, and her brother Andrew asked if he could run the soundboard. By the third production, her sister Laura was on the backstage crew, and their father, a bus driver by day, was playing in the show band. We learned that the arts are one of the few activities in which multiple generations of a single family can participate together. And we became determined to be an arts organization that created more of these opportunities for families. We learned that we should cross lines too. As a professional arts organization, we had a responsibility to help found or strengthen local resources that could exist long after our residency ended. After playing a lead in a Cornerstone production, Ron Temple, a farmer who you can see in this picture stands six feet nine inches tall, founded an arts organization in his rural Kansas community of Norcator. Years later, a state tourism brochure cited the town as, quote, being known far and wide for its arts and culture. This is a town of 220. During his Cornerstone show, Ron turned his farm over to his sons-in-law and spent 14 hours a day rehearsing and trying to learn his lines. This acting thing, Ron said to a camera crew from CBS Evening News, is a lot like sex. Everybody knows a little bit about it, but it's the technique that counts. <laughs> Guillermo Aviles was a high school senior who planned to enlist in the military after his graduation. When he was cast in a leading part in a Cornerstone production in the San Miguel neighborhood of the LA community of Watts, the director persuaded this talented young man to apply to college to study theater. Guillermo not only became the first in his family to achieve higher education, he got his master's degree as well. With a portion of the box office proceeds from the Cornerstone Project in Watts, Guillermo then went on to help found the Watts Village Theater Company that is still creating work under his leadership 17 years later. <laughs> yes, Guillermo. We learned that you can't often know the ripples of the work and that you have to maintain faith. Three years after our hugely controversial and successful biracial Romeo and Juliet in Port Gibson, Mississippi, the community had created only one biracial play on its own. And I'm going to confess to you right now, I felt ashamed. I feared that we had failed these folks in the long haul. We were revisiting the community as part of a national tour, and at least 20 people pulled us aside to tell us the same story. Port Gibson was part of Main Street, USA, a federally funded program for small towns to revitalize their main streets. The community had recently been honored for having, out of 435 Main Street USA towns, the most racially integrated board in the United States. It was because of the play, was the constant refrain. We all met, we all learned to trust each other through the play. So we learned the results of artistic work that strengthens community cannot be measured solely through an artistic lens. In Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, we were invited to put on a play with former employers uh, and employees of Bethlehem Steel in the iron foundry of the home plant, which had re recently shut down the last of its operations. We adapted Aeschylus's Perithius Bound 
to tell the story of a laid off steel worker who is welded, as you can see in this picture, to an actual 20 ton ladle by the forces of progress. The cast included former managers and former workers. On opening night, both the former head of the union and the CEO of the company said almost exactly the same words to me separately. This play was tough to watch and it was fair. Could higher praise be given? While we were working on that Paiute reservation, a Christian minister was urging his congregants to burn their eagle feathers as a symbol of renouncing traditional spiritual, uh, native spiritual practices. The play was packed with clever ideas. Agamemnon returned home from the sacking of Reno with his pickup truck filled with slot machines. <laughs> the Greek gods and goddesses were replaced by animal spirits. Uh, Orestes' guilt over matricide was linked with alcoholism. But as opening night approached, everyone on the reservation was holding their breath in terms of the big question about our play. Would it ultimately endorse traditional and sovereign native ways or values that reflected a Christian and an assimilated American point of view? At that first performance, it was a thrilling moment to watch all heads in the audience, and I mean all heads, nod in unison when Hawk, the adapted character who had been Athena in the original text, say, follow the old ways, my people, or follow the new, but above all, follow them both. Respect the balance 